recording available to you in the next couple of days. Check out the attachments in the download pod for the slides from today's meeting and other resources. This presentation has been made possible by the Preschool Development Grant Birth Through Five Initiative from the Office of Child Care, the Administration for Children and Families, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. We're excited to welcome our experts from AEM today. And without further ado, I'll pass this over to Jim Lesko. Thank you. Thank you, Evelyn. So I'm uh, happy to um, have uh, AEM uh, join us for our second in a series of uh, webinar and communities of conversation um, supporting the preschool development grant uh, and the focus is on data. And today's conversation uh, will be on um, single ID um, effort within state. Um, so today, um, uh, Myself, uh, though I'm just doing introductions, so no credit here, I'm uh, happy to uh, introduce uh, some of my uh, prior colleagues. Uh, Jeff Sellers, he's the TA specialist um, with AEM Corporation, and Jeff Wasson, uh, who is also a TA specialist with the AEM Corporation. And um, we are also fortunate uh, because Jeff and Jeff uh, have been able to um, help us connect with Haley Young, uh, from North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, um, and Deborah Rodriguez, um, Educational Statistics Director with the Office of Data Quality, Pennsylvania Department of Ed. And Haley and Deborah um, will be uh, joining us uh, periodically during the presentation today uh, to share with us uh, their experiences um, around um, single ID. Um, so this community of conversation um, is invited, um, and we um, put out this uh, call and announcement to all the PDG Birth to Five grantees, and uh, we likewise encourage them to share this with their partners and consultants. Uh, we do have the PDG Birth to Five PA team um, on the call today. Um, we also um, have as as invited participants, uh, the federal project officers and regional office representatives, um, and uh, as well as our uh, PDG Birth to Five PA partners from the State Capacity Building Center. Uh, we do want to remind everyone that this is a voluntary com um, you know, participation. We do encourage our grantees to join the call. Um, this uh, remains uh, a part of our ongoing uh, universal technical assistance uh, provision made available to the Birth to Five grantees uh, uh, as a part of the select presentations and resources we made available. We've made available. We will be posting, as Evelyn suggests, uh, uh, indicated uh, this recording on the PDG website, um, which is linked to the Office of Child Care TA Resource Center site. Um, as she mentioned, uh, this call um, is um, uh, we've muted everyone. Uh, we do encourage you to, if you do have a particular question, to put it into the chat box. We monitor that chat box on an ongoing basis uh, during the call, um, and we will make sure we get to them. Uh, I also do want to remind everyone uh, two things. One is, um, if you're on your computer and you're connected um, through your computer for this, please make sure you turn off your computer speakers. Uh, it helps reduce feedback. And secondly, um, in the attachments that are made available, in addition to the slide deck from today's presentation, are a series of resources that Jeff and Jeff um, have recommended as a part of the conversation today. Uh, these resources are provided uh, through the courtesy of AEM Corporation and the presenters, and they are linked to documents um, located on the State Longitudinal Data System website. And um, so we'll have our uh, presentation on the single ID. We'll have the overview from Jeff and Jeff. Um, we'll stop periodically to um, listen and have a conversation with Haley and Deb, as well as an opportunity to um, have discussions or respond to questions and answers um, from uh, any of you joining the call today, 
and we'll have a, a closing conversation um, towards the end. And so um, at this time, I'm going to turn this over to Jeff and Jeff. All right. Thanks, Jeff. All right. Appreciate that. Um, so to kick things off, uh, we wanted to uh, introduce a poll question for you. And so if you can um, re uh, enter your response to the poll question, what do you think is a benefit to having a single child ID? Uh, and enter that into the chat box. You know, a brief, a brief little statement um, about what you think the benefit or the value um, of having a single child ID would be for you in your state. Um, as we go through this um, presentation, um, just to kind of give you a heads up, there will be references to a single ID or single child ID, a unique ID, uh, unique identifiers. All of that is really um, referring to the same thing and is just referencing a unique way to consistently identify a child. And so in, uh, through, throughout our presentation today, you'll see various ways of it being referenced and just know that it all means the same thing. So we are getting some uh, comments here. Um, let's see, reduction in multiple ID, uh, continuity, data linking across systems, uh, longitudinal data and duplication of efforts. Um, the linking of longitudinal data and reducing duplicate counts between programs. So, so again, several references to being able to establish a longitudinal look of uh, of the data and of the students over and children over time. Um, reducing duplicate counts between programs so that that challenge that many times comes over, comes about in trying to uniquely identify a student uh, or a child and um, the ability to know all the services that that child's being uh, provided. Um, let's see, longitudinal tracking possible linking to other state agencies as well. Okay, good. So looking at at other state agencies. So good. These are all good good uh, comments. Um, relating to that single child ID. So, so again, kind of overarching, looking at the ability to track a child over time, longitudinally, linking to other uh, uh, program areas, linking to other agencies. Um, and so we're going to be talking um, some about that in our presentation today and, uh, and actually seeing some of the benefits from, from both uh, North Carolina and, and Pennsylvania. So just a couple of quick comments, um, and then we will introduce our first uh, state panelist. Um, and what is a child, what is an early childhood single unique ID system? And again, these are just kind of uh, characteristics um, of such a system and things to be considered as you um, adopt such a system. First is, you know, the system assigns a unique ID to each child. Um, as they enter the program. And again, um, that uh, is fairly straightforward, but, but again, as that, there, there are considerations that need to be considered going into that. And again, this, this um, what we're describing here is really a, a, a process on the front end that uh, would assign a uh, unique identifier to a child as they are entering into receiving some of these uh, services. Another, uh, really a consideration and, and really an agreement that would need to be made is that everyone who is providing a service, everywhere where that child exists in the system, uh, that unique identifier would need to uh, be uh, assigned to that child. So, so there needs to be agreement and coordination uh, between systems, between services, program offices, in um, assigning and, and using that, that unique ID. Um, as the child progresses uh, through the system, if you will, uh, with the various services they are provided, the ID would need to follow that child as, as they go. And, um, and, and this last bullet is really just something to keep in mind as far as what uh, the benefit of having that unique identifier for that child uh, pre 
K-12 to, to have in place a process that could actually follow, uh, the idea would follow that child into the K-12 system and, and beyond so that uh, the continuity of, of service and the ability to track that child longitudinally could, would, would be with, within the earth context of early childhood but could also extend uh, through their entire education career. Um, so, you know, why have a single ID? You know, what's the benefits? And, and several of you have entered those benefits into the chat box, and just a, a few here. You know, one is the ease of, to ease the process of that child as they transition from a given, from program to program, or even from agency to agency. And so uh, as that identifier uh, follows that child, uh, the, the ability for them to transition would, at least the process of transition, would be eased. Um, the, the facilitation to integrate data or to have a data integration process, and uh, Haley's going to talk a little bit more about that as far as what they do in North, what they are currently doing in North Carolina, but, but it is, um, you know, part of the challenge when it comes to integrating data, in other words, bringing data together from multiple sources, multiple programs, multiple agencies, is to accurately connect that data to the child. So um, having this single ID helps in that integration pro process. Um, uh, another area to minimize the need for uh, that matching process, the algorithms that, that come to play, that an integrated data system would leverage, but having that single ID um, would minimize the need for that and probably increase uh, the ability to accurately match those student records together. Um, then, you know, and, and along those lines, obviously, you have fewer matching errors, may need less manual intervention to reconcile those errors. Um, and then the last two bullets here are really kind of around, related to data quality. Um, uh, the the oh, first one here, overall, fewer uncertainties when reporting on evaluation program enrollment and impact. Again, these, uh, you know, represent some uh, high-stakes kinds of reporting and evaluation. And you definitely want a high degree of confidence in the quality of the data and the uh, establishment of those linkages to that child. And so um, having that single ID kind of helps in your confidence in when you're doing the evaluation, when you are reporting out on the performance of a given program or, or a child, then uh, uh, a single ID helps us, uh, in that degree of confidence. And, and then lastly here, more accurately count ch children and the services that they are providing. Someone made a comment about the ability to um, accurately uh, know all the services that a child is receiving. Um, and so, so again, that single ID would help facilitate that as well. And so much of this, these, uh, what I've been talking about here, really does um, address that idea of establishing that single ID on the front end as a child is brought into uh, the system and starts to receive services. Um, another approach is after the data has been collected on a given child is, is to look at how to integrate that data into a single system and to be able to uh, compile that and and so Haley is going to share a little bit about how North Carolina has been able to do that um, and to, to leverage a, a single ID kind of after the fact, if you will, and to expand their abilities in, in being able to, to look at the diff different aspect of a child and the services they provide. So with that, uh, Haley, I will uh, hand it over to you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so, and we can actually advance to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about North Carolina's Early Childhood Integrated Data System, which uses a single unique identifier to bring together uh, data from multiple early childhood programs in our state. And for us, um, our Early Childhood Data System consists of data from various programs in the areas of early education, health, and social services. 
And this data system was initially built in using Race to the Top uh, grant funding back in 2012. And the system has been live since 2016. Um, and as you'll see on this slide, the idea behind our data system was to collect information in a single data system to give us better insight into how early childhood services are being used across our state. And by being able to look at that data, we would be able to answer key program and policy questions to allow us to make better decisions about um, the way that services are being used in our state. Um, and just to give you a little bit of a sense of um, the way that unique identifiers work for us, we use a technology platform called eScholar um, to identify, or I'm sorry, to do unique identifier assignment for all of our data. And if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, so in terms of the programs that are currently a part of our data system, you'll see on the left-hand side that we have um, many programs. Um, one thing that I didn't mention yet is that our data system is for children ages 0 to 5. Um, all of these programs that are currently in our data system for the most part fall under our Department of Health and Human Services, but we also incorporate data from a couple of other uh, data sources outside of the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, on the right-hand side, you'll see that there are also other data sources that we're looking to incorporate, and some of these programs are actually in active development now for integration, so in particular, we are working actively to integrate home visiting data into our ESIDs, um, and we are also actively working on enabling act, uh, integration to our education data and our K-12 data system. Um, next slide, please. So as I mentioned, this data system has now been live since 2016. Um, so we, we feel proud that we can now say that we have actual integrated data, which has allowed us to look at unduplicated counts of um, where children are being served and by what programs they are being served by. We're also able to do things like link data to answer questions that in the past could not be answered. So for example, we can use the unique identifier for uh, Part C data and link um, that data to Part B data to look at um, what that link data looks like. We also have a research request portal, which is um, available on our website. So this is a place where researchers can go in and submit an IRB-approved research request um, for child-level data. And um, just to emphasize this point, we have many different um, pieces of that research request process in place to ensure that all of our data is um, highly protected and only shared if we have a rigorous research request that is made. Uh, next slide, please. And so what we're really excited about with the preschool development grant is that we actually have the opportunity to look at this data system that has been live since 2016 and has been in what we're thinking of as more of a maintenance phase of the system. So the lights are on and everything is running, but what we would like to do now is to um, expand and improve upon that system. So the PDG gave us a chance to really um, evaluate the way that the system looks now and to think about what we can do to improve it going forward. So on this slide are listed some of the initiatives that we're engaging in um, this year and in, in years to come uh, to expand and improve upon our ESAs. Um, the first bullet is around realigning our data system to make sure that we continue to be aligned to our state priority initiatives for early childhood. So as an example here, um, we as a state have just released our Early Childhood Action Plan, which is a strategic plan to reach quantitative um, targets by the year 2025 statewide. And that plan actually looks at children ages birth to eight. And as I mentioned earlier, our data system only looks at children ages zero to five. So that's one opportunity where we could potentially expand our data to look at that full range of early childhood and be aligned to a state strategic initiative. 
Um, as I mentioned, we're also working on integrating home visiting data in our state. Um, home visiting data right now in North Carolina uh, is collected in a variety of ways depending on the model that you're looking at. And so what we're working on now is aligning data from those different models and then being able to integrate that data into ESID so that we can look at the full range of services that children are receiving, including home visiting. Our state has also just um, conducted a data user survey. So this is a survey to look at where there are gaps in our early childhood data, and then using that information, we can make decisions about whether to expand the data sources that are currently part of our ESID. And then I kind of alluded to this um, a few minutes ago, but we are also actively working on connecting to our K-12 data system through what we're calling the Education Longitudinal Data System. So this is what we're referring to as a system of systems, which would include our ESIDs, which is the Early Childhood Integrated Data System, but it would also include our P20W system, which is that broader K-12 um, data. And then we're also looking at enabling data visualization and expanding reporting and just continuing to improve on that. Uh, next slide, please. Haley, um, just real quick, uh, there's a couple mm -hmm. of questions that have come in. Um, yep. And so uh, just wanted to make sure we uh, get these asked before you even yep, drop I off. Yep, I hadn't so first, seen that. First question is, have you experienced different barriers when trying to integrate data outside of HHS compared to integrating data within HHS? Mm -hmm. If so, what yeah, are those that's a great differences? Question and how did you work through them with the different yep. stakeholders? So there are a couple of thoughts um, there. So the first is that when, for us, what we've experienced is when we are working with an outside agency, um, the really important thing is to develop really strong data sharing agreements from the beginning. Um, I think that that really is what is the most time-consuming part of actually getting to integrated data for cross-agency data sharing. So that's the first thought, is just ensuring that um, the structure is in place to ensure that you have really strong data sharing agreements and that you have all of the right people at the table to develop those. The second thought is that depending on the data source that you're looking at, um, you may be connecting to, for example, a data warehouse that lives within a state agency, but for certain programs, you may also be looking at potentially um, receiving a data extract from a third-party data vendor. So one example of that would be with Head Start data, which um, sometimes that data is actually stored in a third-party data vendor, for example, Child Plus. And so in that case, you would just have a different process where you would need to actually work with a third-party data vendor to get a data extract um, to integrate into your data system. So those are a couple of thoughts um, for that question. Good, thank you. Do you see the, the second question there as well? Yes. Um, in terms of expansion priorities, um, I would say that in my experience, one thing that's important is to think about some of those state priority areas where you can use data to support um, some of the strategic initiatives that your state is putting forth. Um, so I mentioned that our state has released a strategic plan to improve um, early childhood outcomes in our state. And so I think it's really important to think about as you're developing a data system like this, the way that you can design it so that it is able to support some of the key questions that you have to support um, priority initiatives. And then Good, I see you. we got another question. Um, uh -huh. Are we working with data vendors to automate data, data extracts and APIs? Um, so we recently, um, there are a couple of states that actually have started conversations around um, using an API for example, with Head Start data. Um, we currently do not use APIs for our data extracts, but it is something that we're exploring further for some of those um, trickier data sources where we do have to get a data extract. Very good, thank you. Next slide. So 
and yeah, so I think we've we went through a couple of I, th I think some pieces of this slide already, but um, for states that are sort of just starting off in this process, um, I've listed a few things that I think are important to consider. So first of all, who are the end users of your data system and how do you want them to be able to access data? So for example, is it important for your state to have public facing reports and data visualizations online for anyone to access and what would those look like? Um, you know, for us, what we've been considering is what are ways that we can expand the types of users that would be able to access our data better for, um, for example, with policy making around early childhood. Another thing to consider is the type of data system that you want in place. So there are a few different types of data system models that you can use. In North Carolina, we're currently under a federated data system, which means that um, all of the source data is still living in the source data warehouses where um, data was initially stored. And so we just access that data as needed for our data system. There are other versions of models. So for example, you could have a data warehouse where all of your data is stored and managed in one place. Um, I also think that sustainability is a, a very key consideration, especially in terms of technology. So um, thinking about not only what are the upfront costs of developing a data system like this, but also what are the ongoing costs that you should expect. Um, and we kind of touched already on short and long-term priorities, um, but just you know, considering what strategic initiatives you want to align your system to um, so that you can support those initiatives using data through this type of system. Okay. I'm and good. so, and that's it for me. So, thank you. And I think now I'm turning it over to Jeff. Right. And the other just Jeff. To, to wrap yes. up and and. The <laughs> yes. Right. Um, and and I'll turn it over to the other Jeff. <laughs> but um, but I just wanted to um, again thank you, Haley, for for kind of the North Carolina update, if you will. Um, and also too, you know, Haley mentioned this uh, ECIDS or ECIDS, and uh, and again, that's just in, in case you're curious what that uh, acronym is, if you're not familiar with it, it is uh, an early childhood integrated data system. And again, it's an, it's an opportunity to take existing data systems um, and, and, it, and it could be applied in a variety of ways, either in early childhood or even beyond, and put in place a process to be able to extract that uh, those child records um, and then establish a linkage of those records to uniquely identify a, a given child and to attach, if you will, uh, related data and information for them so that you can in turn run uh, reports and, and different kinds of, of uh, information as Haley described that they're doing in North Carolina. So that's really kind of the reference to ECIS or ECIDS is, is a, an integrated data system specifically related to early childhood. So with that, um, I want to hand it off to my partner here, uh, Jeff Watson to continue uh, the process of our uh, presentation. Great, thanks Jeff, and thank you Haley. That was a wonderful uh, overview of what you're doing there in North Carolina. So uh, let's just talk briefly about um, a couple of different models. Uh, so, you know, there are a couple of ways to go about integrating across IDs. One is to have a centralized system. Um, where you're essentially requiring all vendors to use a um, specific and unique ID for a student. And that's different from, I think, what is happening in North Carolina, where vendors are actually using kind of their own individual IDs, but then it's federated up a layer and those IDs are merged across. Um, there's also um, another flavor or another twist on that where your IDs within your individual systems may not be unique and that can be very problematic. Um, and I think that's a situation where um, 
we would all quickly agree to avoid at all costs because then you have to worry about another layer of potential confusion about which child record goes with across how do you match across systems how do you match children's records across systems so um, i'll mostly be talking about the first two in this in this slide so under a single uh, unique id system when a child comes into um, one of your programs that's under that umbrella of early childhood um, your system will need to check to see whether or not that child is in the system and if not then assign an id and that process is um, a critical process um, you want to make sure that you're only assigning ids when in fact a child is not already in the system and so that needs to be designed with care implemented with care and managed with care that ID once assigned uh, should follow the child as they exit and enter into other programs and receive additional services. And so all of that care that goes into that initial assignment needs to be replicated at, at each entry point into each program to make sure that when you look up a student, you're in fact matching the student that's standing right in front of you with the records from that student's past. Um, so if you do that correctly, then all of your systems have each child assigned to a unique ID. And that, you, that ID then is what you would then map on to your other agency data or your cross agency data might be a better term, such as K-12 data or workforce data or post-secondary data. Um, so that's that's kind of the uh, the overview of having a single unique ID. I would like to note that it is still possible to have matching errors in that process. And so, for example, um, if a child receives services at uh, one point in time and then exits and then comes back into the early childhood system after some period of time and presents the program, the second program, with a slightly different set of information. Perhaps they moved. Perhaps the parents uh, divorced and there was a name change. Um, or per perhaps even the child is spelling their name differently now uh, and they've gone from Billy to Bill or William to Bill and they present their information their individual information differently it is possible to sort of um, have a situation where the same child gets two different IDs likewise it would be possible although probably less likely to assign two children to the same ID um, so again, I, the, the point there, I think, to, to think about is that while this is a technical solution um, it, it, at the core, it's very important to involve stake use, stakeholders, end users um, and from, the, from the beginning so that as you design your system, the, the process is aligned to, to how people go about uh, their the work of um, assigning and intaking uh, children into their into their programs. If for uh, if you're thinking about a multiple ID solution, then each child will receive an ID for each program as a as they go through or from one program to the next in your early childhood umbrella. And those records will need to be matched at, with some sort of technical intervention. And that matching process um, 
will probably rely a great deal on the child's demographic and name data. And so if you think back to Jeff Sellers opening comments, um, you know, there is some inefficiency that's being introduced here because each program is intaking a, a child uh, and collecting and uh, executing data entry for all of that same information. So you do lose quite a bit of efficiency on the intake side, but then more importantly, you're going to have to build a layer uh, where you have a process for matching across programs based on that demographic in information. So when you do end up matching across multiple IDs, you are essentially making a guess about what record goes, uh, which records go together. And there are two types of errors you can make when you're making a matching decision. A false positive occurs when two different children are linked under, this, under uh, the same ID. So you've, you've decided that these two children are, these two records, although they're, they're different in a little bit, uh, some minor way, they actually represent the same child. And so then you decide to represent them as the same child. Um, and so you're at odds with reality at that point. Uh, the other type of error would be to, uh, would be failing to connect records that should be connected or matching records that should be, should be matched. And so uh, an example of that might be, um, you have one, one child that's going by William in one system, but a couple of years go by and then he goes by Bill. And everything else looks pretty close, but you know, those two first names are pretty different. So you decide not to match them. Um, in which case you've made a false negative. An example of false positive occurs uh, often with twins where all of the demographic information may be identical except for one letter of the first name, Tim and Jim, for example. Um, so sometimes you'll see as you build out your technical layer exception rules for uh, dealing with false positives that occur from identical twins. So uh, things that can introduce error into that matching process, um, again, different name spellings, emerging nicknames, data entry errors, entering a date of birth, uh, May 3rd, 2018, if you transpose the, the zero and the three, May 30th, 2018. Sometimes people identify race and ethnicity different, differently over time. Uh, parents' names change, guardians change, uh, mobility uh, between, uh, between uh, service areas, in and out of service areas, in and out of state, back into state. Uh, all of those things can kind of create a lot of uncertainty when you're kind of looking at demographic uh, variables. Uh, we can go to the next slide now. So one of the key things that I thought Haley touched on really well is the need to sort of get people involved. And um, uh, I'm sorry, I can't adv advance the slides for my controls. So there it goes. Okay, thank you. Um, and so um, I would encourage everybody to to really think hard about data governance. Uh, data governance is a process and an organizational structure that's designed to manage an organization's data assets for the purpose of achieving their organizational strategic goals. And when you do data governance, you will establish roles and responsibilities and best practices related to data management. And you can see how a lot of what we've talked about really falls under that. 
uh, you're going to need to have a pretty prescriptive process for intaking uh, students or children and their families. Um, and when you do data governance well, um, you'll get better definition about organizational processes, roles and responsibilities. You'll be able to communicate better about who does what and who are the subject matter experts for the different parts of data that you're collecting. Um, as a result, you'll have much better documentation. Your data quality overall will improve. You'll reduce the inconsistencies in how data are collected and managed. Uh, you'll uh, probably have improved coordination between your programs, maybe even between your technical IT groups and your functional groups, as well as your vendors. Uh, you'll have improved collaboration uh, and hopefully you'll see um, a reduced workload that's associated with data cleaning and data documentation while the overall utility of the data will improve. So um, there are resources out there for data governance. Um, and then I'll just go to one more slide. Do a quick time check. I think we're okay. Uh, privacy considerations is our next slide. And again, this has come up before, so I'll just reiterate some of these themes. And um, of course, you'll want to take care not to um, reinvent the wheel and uh, leverage existing um, uh, structures in your state that can help you with developing good data sharing agreements, memorandums of understanding, making sure you're following uh, local and state and federal uh, laws, FERPA, and um, you'll you'll want to you'll want to reach outside of your your team and make sure that you're leveraging other teams that may e exist in your state so that you can uh, avoid reinventing the wheel if possible. So I'll pause here and pose another question to the audience. Um, and if you could use the chat window to tell us what do you think are the biggest challenges in your state to establishing a single unique student identifier? Jeff, while we are getting response to that poll question, there was an additional question asking about what an API is. Can you briefly describe that? Sure, an API is a, a relatively uh, a new approach to moving data between applications. When I say relatively, uh, it's not brand new. It's, the APIs have been around uh, for long enough to actually become uh, the industry standard for moving data. Uh, in, in many cases, people start with APIs and then build out the rest of their applications uh, around that. Um, there is um, uh, quite a few resources on the web around APIs because they are so common. Um, so um, I don't know if that's sufficiently detailed answer. Uh, feel free to follow up that question if you have any follow up questions. Um, but essentially an API is, stands for uh, application um, Oh, I'm spacing on the, the acronym, but uh, Application Protocol Interface, I believe. Um, and it's it's essentially a way to send data uh, between two ways, by the way, uh, between different applications. So you can think of it as a way of integrating data across. You could send, um, send data both ways, which is a little easier than how you might do with traditional ETL tools. Okay, so uh, let me just kind of scan through the answers for where the biggest challenges are. Um, and so I'll start at the bottom. Un unduplicated counts and being able to track across multiple systems. Um, easier to collaborate with other agency. Uh, easy ability to, I'm not sure. Oh, I see my chat window wasn't scrolled all the way down. Okay, um, so challenges. Um, Yes, relevant agencies to agree on having a unique ID. Absolutely. 
uh, you do need to make sure you have conversations early and often and develop those MOUs and develop uh, the interagency agreement to move forward with that approach. Um, whether to build it internally or buy uh, off the shelf. Uh, what do I recommend? I, <laughs> I wouldn't recommend anything right now, but I would recommend uh, considering that question carefully and ultimately make sure you talk to your stakeholders and have a vision for what you need your system to do and who your stakeholders are before you get too far into that decision. Start with your stakeholders, start, start with your end users and clearly articulate uh, what data you need to collect, how you're going to merge across IDs and, um, and, and how all of that fits within your organizational strategic goals. Uh, Inter-department jurisdiction, uh, lack of legislative mandate, indeed, um, politi politics, absolutely. Uh, the, the problem of silos is still very much uh, a real problem. Um, silos exist and we run into them every day. Uh, establishing the data governance structure and updating legacy software, indeed, there's a lot of work to do here. And so, again, I, I think it's really important to focus on what do you need to do, uh, what, do you, what are you trying to accomplish and, and where can you start and what are some, maybe some other things that are longer term uh, efforts. Um, so with that said, those are great answers. I'm going to hand it over to Deborah Rodriguez from Pennsylvania Department of Education so we can hear about her experience, her program's experience with single child identifiers in Pennsylvania. Deborah. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I also have along with me, I'm going to share as we go along here, um, Michelle Key from the Office of Child Development and Early Learning. Um, that is a Department of Human Services office that is also a Department of Education office that um, was the very first agency we, we shared data with, um, and having a foot in both agencies enabled that. Um, I also have Tim Wentz, who's going to talk about our sharing with um, data around foster children. Um, and finally, I have Missy Conyer, who is our um, PA Secure ID expert, to answer any questions people may have. So Pennsylvania began um, individual student education ID in 2008 with our K-12 to students. We are also using the eScholar Unique ID product. Um, it is a separate system from our state longitudinal data system. The only purpose of Unique ID is to create and store each student's individual student ID. Um, this is an ID that should follow them from the very first time they enter education or educational services from early childhood through post-secondary into adulthood. Um, we, we try to help our agencies and institutions understand this is much like a social security number. It should not be changed. It should be one number per one person. Um, and obviously that enables us to share data accurately. It is, um, we developed a link so again, Pennsylvania has a federated system. Each agency is maintaining their data in their own system. We have a, uh, and Michelle will talk about how we create PA secure IDs for our early childhood students. We have a, what we call a bridge, and it basically links the education system with the early childhood system to allow aggregate data to return so the Early Childhood Program Office can see how their students are going to evaluate, or part, evaluate their programs once their students get into third grade and above where we have state testing. Um, I, it's automated in the fact that you can upload a file and if there are no children in the system that look like the data you entered, it automatically assigns the ID to the child. 
um, if there is a student in the system who exactly matches the record you uploaded, it will give you that student's ID back, um, not to create a new one. However, it is a manual process in that there are going to be a number of records every time you upload a large file where it may or may not be the same child or there are multiple records. We call that a near match, and that takes manual intervention to look at the records and determine whether or not it is the same child um, and then assign that number or find another create a new number for the individual. There are some policies that really help. Um, it, these policies, I'm sure, are, are more difficult to enforce on the early childhood side, um, but it is essential to enter a student's legal name. There are a few exceptions where that may not be possible, um, but 99% of the time, if it is possible to verify that name by some legal document. Um, no nicknames should ever be used. Uh, we've already heard what happens when you know William is then entered as Bill. Last name, first name, and while middle name and middle initial are not required, they are highly encouraged and recommended because the more information in the record, um, the, the the better the system will work, and the less likely two students will share the same ID. We first did this in 2008. Um, I'm surprised at the number of times a name that looked very unique actually had someone else with the same name in another part of the state. Um, again, birthday has to be accurate. Uh, one of the lessons we learned early on is even though a child might be eligible for services before they are born. Um, don't allow a due date to be entered as a birth date because rarely is the birth date the, the due date and that causes problems down the road. Um, another place we've had issues is when a student goes into post-secondary education. Um, there aren't quite the same guidelines around collecting information from students on the post-secondary level, and sometimes it became difficult to get the legal name of the student. Also, what we found in post-secondary, um, a hole we had to plug early on was uh, because birthday was not required, some institutions were just entering 1-1-1900 for everyone's birthday, and because birthday has such a significant part in determining if it's the same child, um, it always assigned a new number, preventing us from linking the students K to 12 with their post-secondary. Um, we obviously plugged that hole. We highly recommend, and this was not something we did in the first year of assigning a PA Secure ID. It wasn't until the second year we actually started using that ID to collect data. We highly recommend that this information be shared in a confidential manner, the same way you would share something like social security number when a student moves from one educational institution to another. That could be you know, transferring from one school district to another school district, or on their transcripts going into post-secondary education. That's obviously the place where the receiving institution can be sure that they have the right number for the student that they are receiving. I'm going to pass on to Michelle, who's going to talk about the early childhood ID. Uh, Michelle, this is Jeff Watson. Sorry to interrupt, but I would like to do just a, a quick reminder on our time. We're at 2.54, so we have about five or six minutes left. All right, I'll be um, fast and for short on time. So this is Michelle. Um, I'll just add a few things to what Deb already shared. Um, so we do, we have a lot of people entering data into our early childhood data system, which is Pelican. Um, so while we recommend that they use legal name and date of birth, that doesn't always happen. So I think our biggest takeaway, probably from this whole process of having a unique ID, is our data quality issues. Um, 
We do have headquarters staff that process our PA Secure ID near masses, um, but our children in our um, office also get a unique ID that links to our Department of Human Services. Um, so I would just say, I guess, our lesson learned is we have some data quality issues and we're trying to um, alleviate that with children having duplicate IDs. Um, so I'm going to actually pass it over to Tim, just since we're running out of time, um, and then we'll get to the questions. Hello, this is Tim. Uh, what I've been doing with the PA Secure ID and DHS is uh, working with them to identify the foster students. Uh, so DHS has been uh, providing a file to uh, uh, the Department of Education. It is their uh, APCARS file, which is a uh, file that they submit to the uh, federal government two times a year. And uh, basically, we, we pull the demographics off of the AFGARS file and try to match them up with uh, PA Secure ID here on our end to see if we can uh, find a ID um, in our system that DHS has already identified as a uh, foster student. And once we uh, identify that, that uh, match, we provide that information back to DHS, and uh, it, we also uh, keep that information uh, for ourselves, so that way we can uh, share some reports with DHS and um, provide them with the, the analysis that they need for uh, their foster students uh, versus students that are not in foster care. Um, so once again, that's done with all the demographics. Not every single child gets matched. Um, about 90% of them do. And then we have a manual process where we have to look at each individual uh, uh, ID student demographics to uh, uh, try to identify that student. And do you want us just to answer the questions, or how do you want us to proceed? We have like three minutes. Yeah, we have three minutes. So if you could, so let's take the uh, the last one first because it's probably a yes or no. Does Pennsylvania have a student, a statewide student ID system? I assume that's a, a K-12 student ID system. It is the K-12 system, but it is where we are maintaining the records for the um, the early childhood students as well. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Just the ID records, not all detailed data that the Department of Human Services has. Gotcha, gotcha. How do, uh, how does Pennsylvania handle situations where a child has two last names and sometimes that gets recorded differently uh, depending on how you do the data entry? That's where we strongly encourage the legal last name. If it's a hyphenated name, the system will accept it. Um, it, it obviously is a problem. It causes near matches. The one thing we did a few years ago which has greatly helped us is we created a linkage between our PA Secure ID system and our state longitudinal data system. When you upload a record into the SLDS, if the PA Secure ID and the student name, anything else on that, don't match, then the record won't upload your file will fail. So that yeah. kind of forces, and date of birth as well, that kind of forces the correct information. Right, right, that makes sense. Uh, well, thank you very much for sharing that. I'd like to use our remaining minute to just kind of touch on some highlights that, I, that came up all the way through today's discussion. Um, so things to consider as you move forward with a single ID system. Um, our early childhood program identifier is already established in your state somewhere. Uh, what is the overall design of your state's integrated data system? Uh, what is the scope that you need uh, out of your unique identifier? Um, are there already people in your state doing matching procedures? Uh, and a few more. So I, I think today's discussion has been very rich uh, and smattered with both a little bit of theory, but also a whole lot of practice. And I personally appreciate that very much. I'd like to thank uh, 
Deborah and her team, as well as Haley uh, and her team, uh, Jeff and Jim, and uh, everybody else for joining us today. Uh, Jim, did you want to wrap us up? Yes. Um, just um, let's see. So, um, as I mentioned previously, um, there is the list of resources that um, have been posted. Uh, thank you to Jeff and Jeff for making those uh, resources available to us. Um, if there are some questions, I think we did get to most of the questions today. Um, if you do have further questions uh, following today, you can either uh, email those questions uh, to us at pdgb5ta team. You see that email um, link there. And we would love to hear your feedback and suggestions. Um, you can uh, actually uh, click um, on the Survey Monkey uh, link um, on this uh, uh, PowerPoint slide. It will take you immediately to the survey uh, link. We would love your feedback. Um, we, we will have uh, a, additional webinar events and a communities of conversation through the end of September. Um, and your feedback um, is very helpful to us uh, to customize, to make sure we're uh, meeting your direct needs. Um, and uh, you will, uh, for those of you who have registered, uh, we will be sharing a, uh, the link to the recording and uh, uh, an additional link to the Survey Monkey. If you can't get to it today, uh, we would love still to hear, um, see your feedback. I do want to thank uh, Jeff and Jeff and uh, Deb and Haley for um, making your time available today. Uh, I know that uh, there's some really fascinating information, um, and I know it was very helpful. And I uh, can imagine um, many of you will be doing some follow-up uh, connections. And if we can assist you in any way uh, with those connections, please reach out to your uh, PDG B5 TA specialist, and we'll be glad to help facilitate some of those uh, linkages and or answer your questions. And thank you um, to Evelyn um, Heating behind the scenes, our uh, webinar manager today. Thank you so much for making sure everything uh, worked um, as it needed to. And um, we'll end. Um, we'll have a, 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 the next in the series of data webinars, by the way, uh, will be on August 8th, um, and that will be on data privacy. Thanks so much, Jeff and Jeff and Devin Haley. Bye.